Hello class, so today we're talking about Frederick Nietzsche's philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks. Written sometime in the 1870s after meeting the composer Richard Wagner and before the end of his professorship of philology in Basel in 1876, Frederick Nietzsche's philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks discloses the heritage of ancient Greek philosophy with the pre-Socratics. Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, Parmenides, then abruptly leaving the book unfinished with Anaxagoras. Posthumously published uh, sometime in 1962, uh, this book offers insight into Nietzsche's thought and the beginning of Greek philosophy, the birth of Western philosophy. We will only cover the opening segments of the book alongside the points highlighted in Marion Cohen's introduction, followed by the metaphysical implication of Nietzsche's reading of the pre-Socratic Thales of Meletus. If we know anything, Nietzsche was a philologist, and the discipline of philology is one of interpretation and clarification of ancient texts and languages. The philologist has the responsibility of helping living generations understand ancient texts from generations long since gone. We cannot avoid seeing this activity reflected in Nietzsche's philosophical context, the tradition from tradition to rebellion is central to Nietzsche's, the, excuse me, the transition from tradition to rebellion is central to Nietzsche's iconoclasm. The philosopher fixes the ancients to the present. If the pre-Socratics stood in stark contrast to the myth-bound myth culture of ancient Greece, then a philosopher for Nietzsche is someone who breaks with tradition while remaining timely. Cohen emphasizes how Nietzsche recognized the bridging from the semi-worldly worldly boundlessness of mythology to the bounded restraint of reason by the creativity of philosophy as it's blended with philology. The world of the Greek myths is challenged and at the same time echoed by the earthly and the in elemental empiricism of the first philosopher, the first Greek philosopher, Thales. Thales held that, quote, water is the origin of all things. Nietzsche writes, quote, Thales is a creative master who began to see into the depths of nature without the help of fantastic fable, unquote. Here we have Nietzschean philosophical creativity, willful, radical, and all rooted in life, Willis making untimely observations that serve to challenge the ordinary, the traditional. After Nietzsche introduces Thales, Lyconic proposition that the origin of everything is water, Nietzsche qualifies three distinctions. One, first because it, Thales' assertion that the origin of all things is water, tells something about the primal origin of things. Two, second, because it does so in language devoid of image or fable. And three, finally, because contained in it, if only embryonically, is the thought, all things are one. With this tripartite qualification, we have a ready-made metaphysical lesson. Nietzsche's first assertion has the metaphysical characteristic of looking into the origin of things, of all things. For Aristotle, who postdates Thales by approximately 165 years, considers this to be fundamental to the study of metaphysics, otherwise known as the science of first principles, the origin of things. To seek and to study the origin of something is to determine what something is. To determine what something is is ontological 
and originary. Thus, to claim that everything originates with water is plainly metaphysical. On Nietzsche's second assertion, we have the distinction that Thales is using language devoid of image or fable. This has the metaphysical component of looking to the nature of ultimate reality beyond the confines of mythic tradition. At the same time, mythic tradition begins with the same metaphysical impulse to answer what is at the heart of reality. What does reality consist of? In the case of myths, such metaphysical questions are answered by the way of Zeus and the other gods. In the case of Thales, the metaphysical question is answered with the first hypothesis of natural science. Everything originates with water. With Nietzsche's last assertion, we find another startling, rich, metaphysical foundation. All things are one. Whether all things partake of the one or the many is a pre-Socratic theme extending from Thales and beyond. Philosophy operates in vast generality, and this tendency is metaphysical. We want to know how the parts of our specific lives contribute to the whole and to the rest of the world. Humanity and the universe. To arrive at the conclusion that everything arises from water is somewhat unscientific, and this is breaking with tradition. He, Thales, has the radically mythic audacity to claim that everything is water. We still recognize a general truth. Water is real and essential to life on Earth. Nietzsche's untimely lesson is metaphysical philosophy. If all things are one, then all reality, ancient and contemporary, is unified in a proto-scientific way. We are one with the earth, enlivened by water. Philosophy bridges the gap between the mythic transitioning into the strictness of empirical science into what is. If Nietzsche's philology interprets the past for us in the present moment, then Nietzsche's words are taken to heart. Thales was radical in his proposition that the origin of everything is water. This is a step away from answering the question, what is everything's origin with a god, with Zeus, an immortal person, the gods. Nietzsche indicates that philosophy is creative in its endeavors beyond science. Philosophy has the task of finding new insights, new techniques of thinking borrowed from the ancients, exposing the overlooked into the everyday. Thank you.